Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Trinity Lutheran Church. We're very happy to have you here with us worshiping this morning. A few quick items. There are yellow cards in the pews in front of you. Those are for prayer requests. Uh, whether this is your first time or 101st time, we are all in a constant state of being in desperate need for prayer every day of our lives. And so this provides us as a church an opportunity to pray for each other and with each other and over each other as, as a family and as a congregation. So I invite you to fill those out and the elders will be collecting, collecting them during the third song. There are also blue cards in the pews in front of you and those are for attendance. We like to know who we're worshiping with each Sunday. So if you'd take a moment to fill those out and pass it in along with the offering, that would be super duper. So as we begin in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Amen. I invite you to stand and sing with us as we begin worship this morning. All right. This one has hand motions, which is great. So <laughs> if you'd be interested in learning hand motions this morning, stand up. Oh, look, you're all standing. Great. So the <laughs> got one pity laugh. So the chorus goes waves of mercy, waves of grace, everywhere I look. I see your face, your love has captured me. Oh my God, this love, how can it be? Now I would like to note that the right side of the congregation, a lot more participatory than the left side. So as we continue singing this morning, I expect to see a little bit more of the arms moving. So let's go ahead and get started. Every move I make, I'm making you. You make me move, Jesus. Every breath I take, I breathe in you. Every step I take, I take in you. You are my way, Jesus. Every breath I take, I breathe in you. Give yourself a hand. You I, may be seated. I think maybe we need confession and forgiveness. <laughs> that was very good. Thank you. Enjoyed that. Um, <clears throat> when you were a little kid and your mom or dad said, Sonny, uh, girl, do this or that, sometimes you heard those words, right? But you didn't do it. So you might as well be deaf or you saw something that you knew you shouldn't touch as a child, but the temptation was so great that you took it and you picked it up, even though you shouldn't have. So you saw it, but it was kind of like you were blind. And that seems to me <clears throat> the direction uh, at which we are heading ourselves this morning, directing ourselves as we hear the Word of God speak to us 
about what I would call spiritual blindness and spiritual deafness. And so take a moment to think about that in your relationship with God. Do you listen to God? Maybe you hear the words, but do you follow through? Uh, you see what it is that you are to do in your life, and yet you decide to look the other way. And that's kind of like being blind. Spiritual deafness, spiritual blindness, Help us, Lord, to recover from these ailments. So take a moment and just think about those things. And I suppose that we will be amazed when we hear the Old Testament lesson today and are reminded that the servant of God, who finally is Jesus Christ, is one who hears, but does, who has ears, but does not hear. He has eyes, but he does not see. The Lord's servant. And that's referring to this fact that God, through Christ, casts a blind eye to our sin and closes his ears to those things which we say that are not in sync that's another way of saying he forgives us. And so it's my great privilege to remind you and to remind myself that we have a God who forgives our weaknesses in terms of spiritual hearing and seeing. The Lord Jesus Christ has given his life for you to give you forgiveness. And it's my pleasure, my privilege to remind you and me of that through Jesus Christ, amen. I'd like to invite our scripture reader forward. First lesson is from Isaiah chapter 42, verses 14 to 21. For a long time I have held my peace. I have kept still and restrained myself. 
Now I will cry out like a woman in labor. I will gasp and pant. I will lay waste mountains and hills and dry up all their vegetation. And I will turn the rivers into islands and dry up the pools. And I will lead the blind in a way that they do not know. In paths that they have not known, I will guide them. I will turn the darkness before them into light, the rough places into level ground. These are the things I do, and I do not forsake them. They are turned back and utterly put to shame, who trust in carved idols, who say to metal images, you are our gods. Hear you deaf, and look you blind, that you may see, who is blind but my servant, or deaf as my messenger, whom I said, whom I send. Who is blind as my dedicated one, or blind as the servant of the Lord. He sees many things, but does not observe them. His ears are open, but he does not hear. The Lord was pleased for his righteousness sake to magnify his law and make it glorious. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Second lessons from Ephesians chapter five, verses eight to 14. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in, that, in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'm wondering if um, you could go over to that lectern and give me that scripture book that's in there. It's probably right on the top or wherever. I'm not sure where it would be. Oh, here it is. Thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't know what happened to it. Uh, the reason I wanted this book, <clears throat> in the, on the PowerPoint today for the gospel, you're going to have John 9, etc. You can see that John chapter 9 is excerpted. But I want to read the entire chapter. It's a little bit long, but this is a story that you just got to hear, and we'll be speaking about it later, so it won't sink with the PowerPoint. But the Holy Gospel is John chapter 9, verse 1 through 41. And you can remain seated for this. It's just a little bit long. If you want to stand and be pious and blessed, that would be all right, too. <laughs> this is a marvelous, marvelous event in the life of Jesus. Enjoy it. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? <clears throat> Jesus answered, It was not this man sinned, that this man sinned, or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went, and he washed and came back seen. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, is not this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, it's he. Others said, no, but he's like him. He kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I don't know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put mud on my eyes and I washed and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. So they said again to the blind man, well, what do you say about him since he opened your eyes? He said, he is a prophet. But the Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, 
Is this your son, who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But how he now sees, we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He'll speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So for the second time, they called the man who had been born blind and said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner, he answered. Whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, what did he do to you? He answered them, I've told you already and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want also to become his disciples? And they reviled him saying, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, well, this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from and yet he opened my eyes? We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born in utter sin, and would you teach us? And they cast him out. That means they threw him out of the synagogue. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and having found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, and who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, you've seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Jesus said, for judgment I came into this world that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees heard him say these things and said to him, are we also blind? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say, we see, your guilt remains. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord. O Christ. Let's see, what do we do now? <laughs> As we sing this next song together, the elders will collect prayer cards. That scripture reading always reminds me that it's, it's very difficult for me and perhaps some of you to really accept and grasp the almost impossible, miraculous nature of the idea that a blind man, after meeting with the Savior, regained his sight. It's something we nod at, at as, a, as a story, but to actually conceive it and bring it and breathe it into something of, of actuality and really believing it and accepting the truth of that is very difficult, but it's no different than the, the miraculous nature of the love that he shares with us day to day as we interact with our Christ every single day. And so as we sing about God's love for us in this next song, I just invite you to really contemplate the concept that his miraculous touch in your daily life is no different and no less amazing and no less starkly reality-defying than that he could bring sight to a blind man.
us. Thank you. Beautiful. Well, greetings. I'm looking across this beautiful congregation and I see all these wonderful people. Mary, who is 99. I just think that's incredible. And uh, I see over here my good friends, the Muranos. Um, hi, guys. Good to see you. These beautiful people are having a child baptized on April the 9th at the 11 o'clock service. And that's going to be an honor for all of us to be there. Are you having a party afterwards that we can all come to at your house, dinner? <laughs> anyway, what a great blessing that is. Um, <clears throat> We have some wonderful things to be thinking about today in our worship. We've already talked about it, the scripture readings and all. And what a, what a privilege it is for us to come and see and to hear God's word and the miracle of his grace in Jesus Christ. And I pray that you're all blessed by that. Welcome to Trinity. If we have guests here who do not have a church home, please consider this to be your home. Uh, we're honored you're here. So God bless you and take a moment to greet one another, however you'd like to do that. Please. Oh, good to see you. Excellent. You guys are here now for how many? Until the second week of April, we'll be all back. thing I wanted to uh, let everybody know about, there's a sign-up sheet in the back for uh, name tags. I know that, uh, that we have these uh, temporary ones, but the congregation would like to get permanent name tags. And the step number one is that uh, if you're a member here, if, even if you're not, but you want to attend regularly, uh, then just sign up in the sign-up sheet in the back there as you first come in the door. Right, it's on the table there. It's pretty easy to see. Just put your name down there, and you're going to get a name tag. They're going to one's just going to come here to the church, and you'll get one. It's a nice one. I believe it's going to be one of the magnetic kind, the, uh, if I remember correctly. Uh, so it'll be real nice. It'll be permanent, and uh, it'll have a little magnet on the back, and you'll be able to wear it each Sunday. Uh, I think you'll be responsible for remembering it back every every Sunday. Uh, you know, maybe you could try to get away with sticking it in the, uh, in the pews, but <laughs> maybe that would work out. But, uh, and if you can pay for it, that's fine, but you don't have to pay for it right away. You can pay for it when you can. Even if you can't afford it, then that's fine. Uh, one will just be provided for you. Uh, but we'd like to take collections for them. If you can, uh, give $7 for it, that's great. Like I said, if you can't, that's fine too. Uh, but if you can, if you can put $7 for each name tag, you can put it in here and just write uh, name tag, name tag donation. As long as it says name tag, I'm sure everybody will understand there. So, so thank you for that. Uh, next Saturday, meet your neighbor walk. I think you've heard about that before. Uh, next Saturday morning, uh, the folks are going to meet in the parking lot at 10 a.m. It doesn't say specifically, but I would assume it's that parking lot uh, over there on Livingston. Yeah, it does say Livingston uh, par Parking. So it is that. It's the uh, parking on uh, Livingston there. So just meet there at 10 a.m. if you'd like to be involved with that. Uh, walk around the neighborhood, uh, see if folks have something they'd like to pray about, and just let them know we're here uh, in case they miss the big church here. Uh, just to invite them in. Uh, the Great Easter Surprise is coming up April the 8th uh, from 10 to 11. That's open for everybody, so you can tell your friends and neighbors about that. Uh, fun for the family and kids and that sort of thing. Uh, you can sponsor Trinity Walkers. There's a really nice pamphlet in the back. It's got this little baby laying in a uh, in a little uh, a little floaty thing in the water. It's pretty cute back there. Uh, 
but uh, you can sponsor that if you'd like. You can just pick up one of those flyers there and read more about that if you'd like. And also, if you, lastly, just if you don't know, there's Wednesday Lent devotions at 12:10 and 7 p.m. If you'd like to join us, thank you. Just to attach something to the announcements, uh, <clears throat> this past week, late this week, <clears throat> Deaconess Elizabeth Borth received a divine call from Redeeming Life uh, Church Association uh, with the uh, Women's Shelter, which they carry on there, to become a deaconess there and to serve them in their ministry. <clears throat> she has a call now. So she has two. She has one here to our congregation and one uh, to Redeeming Life in Sanford. Um, Liz has been here <clears throat> for us over nine years, I believe it has, and she's a presence here, a persona. Uh, it would be really difficult to uh, have to say goodbye to her. We hope we don't. She has two calls, so that now it's our turn as Trinity to reassess that and to talk with her about maybe a little bit different shift of her call here at Trinity uh, to make it easy for her to stay with us. But such conversations will take place this coming week, and I ask you to pray uh, for Deaconess Liz. I'm really glad for the affirmation she has received uh, by receiving this call. That's a wonderful thing for a worker in the church. So keep uh, our dear Deaconess Liz in your prayers, and I know you will. Thank you. In Jeremiah, <clears throat> the prophet, we hear these words in the fifth chapter. Hear this, O foolish and senseless people who have ears but hear not, who have eyes but see not. So to have a set of ears doesn't really mean you're listening. To have a set of eyes that work doesn't mean you're really seeing things properly. And that really is kind of behind what we're uh, going to speak about this morning, and I pray that God will bless us as we do. I have come to the conclusion that I need Jesus to be my hearing and Jesus to be my sight. And when that happens, I'm going to be all right. In the meantime, I struggle. You know, it's a real <clears throat> a problem uh, in our culture, it's a problem everywhere. You know, people see things and misinterpret them. That's like being blind, I guess. Or you hear things and you don't get the message, and well, you might as well be deaf. And that is kind of the thing that is an undercurrent under what we say today, and it also comes up in the gospel for today when Jesus is dealing with this really remarkable man who is given his sight, and in his discourses, with the Pharisees and others who are trying to put him down, despite the wonderful thing he's done, Jesus says, you know, you're like people that have sight, but you're blind. You hear, but you really don't. You might as well be deaf. And of course, our Lord is speaking about, I guess we would call it spiritual deafness, spiritual blindness. And so we have to think about that for sure. What is it about us that makes us spiritually blind or spiritually deaf? Well, maybe we see things we don't like. Uh, maybe we're confronted <clears throat> by God and his holy word and his commandments or whatever it is. And we say, no, I'm going to go another way. When you think about it, <clears throat> you could go back into the Garden of Eden and say that our dear four parents, Adam and Eve, were both blind and deaf, spiritually speaking. The word of God was in their midst, and they had evidently even had converse with God in some mysterious way as God walked through the garden in the cool of the day. So there was a time when they could understand what they heard properly, interpret what they saw properly, but then Satan comes into the mix and everything gets confused. And suddenly, perfectly good eyesight doesn't do them any good. Perfectly good hearing goes away and they're in trouble. And I guess one could say that it's the presence of Satan in my life or in your life or in the world that causes people not to see properly or to hear properly when it comes to the things of God. No, that's not an excuse. In, in the epistles of St. Paul, he tells us to avoid things uh, that will cause us to have bad hearing or sight. Uh, we're reminded that we should avoid obscene talk. We should not involve our eyes in things like, well, pornography. Those evil things come and cause blindness and scales to go over our eyes so that now we don't see anything properly anymore. We lose focus spiritually. And that's the thing that we're getting to today, it seems to me, in the readings. 
In the Old Testament lesson, Isaiah, the prophet, uh, portrays God as, as a woman in travel, and she is groaning, uh, waiting to give birth. And I take from that that God is, is eager for us to get on in our lives and to get things properly assigned so that our eyes see the right things and our ears hear the right things and we interpret them properly as children of God and not as children of wrath. Because bad eyesight and bad hearing, spiritually speaking, will take us down a bad path. And it's not good. It's a path that leads to destruction, and God would save us from that. I guess I mentioned at the beginning of the service, I, maybe it was another service, but in the Old Testament lesson, as you read through the end of it, the Lord presents his servant to us. Isaiah 42 is one of the great servant poems in the Old Testament which are all talking to us about the one who comes into the world called the anointed one. That word anointed, by the way, means Messiah. So these are poems about the Messiah. And in the one that we read this morning, God reminds us that his servant hears, but he does not respond to what he hears. He, he has eyes, but he's blinded to what he sees. And I think that's a kind of an obscure, hidden gospel message where God is reminding us that although we see improperly and hear improperly in terms of what he puts before us and speaks to us, yet we have a servant who comes in and doesn't notice that, as it were, and takes our sin and puts it aside and then takes it upon himself, the blame for that sin, if you will, God's punishment, puts it upon himself so that it's as if God, as we said last week or some week in our devotions in, in, in Lent, God forgets our sin. He suffers amnesia for our sakes. So that's good news. And as we think about our spiritual malaise in terms of seeing improperly, hearing improperly, we're encouraged already at the beginning that God understands that and he has dealt with it. And he will continue to deal with it for our sake so that God finally looks at us and says they've got perfect spiritual hearing and they're seeing things correctly. But that doesn't let us off the hook because we're called now to live as we are, the sanctified, redeemed children of God. We're to live that way so that we train our ears to hear properly. We see eyes clearly focused on the gospel. We're not distracted and drawn away. Something like that. Now let's go way back into history. Uh, the history we're talking about is the Old Testament history. And I would take you back to the days of Hezekiah, the king of Judah. And he began his reign as the king of Judah in 715 BC. And he ruled for about 27 years before he died. It's an interesting history. Hezekiah was one of the good guys. And when you go into Old Testament history, some of these kings are just the worst thing you can imagine. And they lead their people astray. Keep in mind, as well. At this point in the history of God's ancient people, we have two kingdoms, as it were. The kingdom of Israel, the ten tribes, and then the kingdom of Judah down here. Now, the kingdom of Israel had terrible kings to a, to a man. They were just atrocious. And they led the people of God away so that the people of God couldn't hear God's word anymore, couldn't see things properly, and they listened instead to the God of Baal, the great rain god. They heard things from Baal, which no one should hear. They saw things being done in worship of Baal that no one should see, lest be invited into that terrible type of worship that they did. But nonetheless, the kings of Israel were bad. They were in bad shape, and they were being threatened by the Assyrians. You know, that's always in the Old Testament. It's always there. What are the Assyrians doing? What are the Babylonians doing? It has everything to do with the people of God. And, and what happened to them, their fate, and ours as well. But nonetheless, when you go back to Hezekiah, 715 B.C., Hezekiah was at a point in his life where he had to cry out to God for help because the Assyrians, under the leadership of Sennacherib, were threatening both the north and the south. And Hezekiah had already tasted some of that threat from the Assyrians, and they had sent letters down threatening the people of God that they're going to come in and take over. You have no way to escape Sennacherib and our mighty Assyrian gods. And the people of Judah were trembling, Hezekiah as well. And so Hezekiah, being a smart man, prays to God. 
and God gives him some insight and things that he needs to do to protect his people for the future. So one of the things Hezekiah does is this. He says, if the Assyrian army comes and puts a siege around Jerusalem, we're going to die. We won't have hunger, we won't have food, we won't have water. So in order to deal with the food thing, they store food up and stockpile it. <laughs> there are companies you can call on today to buy food, right? Uh, you can put it on your shelf and it'll last for 25 years. I always think that's kind of a funny thing. What if you bought a whole bunch of food for 25 years and then you eat it and then what do you do? <laughs> but nonetheless, they, they stockpile. But for the water, there was a problem because there were no good wells in Jerusalem. So Hezekiah said, well, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to build a pipeline, my keystone pipeline. And so he goes to the waters of Gihon, the well, still there, this spring. And it's about, oh, a half a mile, three quarters of a mile from the heart of Jerusalem where Hezekiah was. But it was outside the city. But he went out there and he began a major construction project. And people look at it and marvel at it today, wonder how in the world did people of 7th century BC do this? And what they did is they built a tunnel right through solid rock all the way from Gihon into the area where Hezekiah was in Jerusalem. And this tunnel is alive and well today and water gushes through it from the spring of Gihon into the Jerusalem city where it collects in a pond. It's 1,700 feet long. Uh, it's two and a half feet wide, generally, so you can walk through it. It's two and three, two and two-thirds foot high at its lowest, and 11 and a half feet tall at its height. It's a massive undertaking, and it worked. So now Jerusalem's got water. And Hezekiah did this in order to save his people, and it did come in handy, it really did. But here's the thing that strikes me about these Old Testament people. They're doing what they need to do for their lives, and they're serving God to the best of their ability. They fall all over themselves like we do, and yet they try to do what they can do. I was just thinking about this prayer thing that we're doing here in a while. What's going to happen with that? Who knows? But on that day, some people from the congregation will be going out into this community. Now, they're not digging a tunnel or anything. But they are speaking to God as God gives the opportunity about his word and the wonderful thing he's done, about the ministry at Trinity. Who knows what that might result in someday? I have no idea. Maybe 30 years from now, someone will come into the community of Christ and say, you know, the first time I ever really heard about this is when some people came by my house and said, can we pray for you? That's the way God works through the things we do, doing things for the future about which we know nothing. And Hezekiah is a perfect example. Because this thing that he built to save his people was going to be the place where Jesus sends a blind man one day to wash in the pool of Siloam, which is the collecting place for the waters of the Gihon Spring in Jerusalem. It's kind of interesting, archaeologically speaking, for years, for decades, for centuries, uh, we thought we knew where it was. Turns out in 2004, everyone was wrong. And they now have discovered the original place where the water's collected from Hezekiah's tunnel. And that's called, of course, the Pool of Siloam. Earlier, it had been mislocated by the archaeologist, but now it's there, 2004. You can go there today and bathe your feet in it, wash your body if you wish. But our Lord Jesus Christ uses that pool that Hezekiah uh, made possible for a wonderful, wonderful miracle by which he teaches us and blesses us. You know, this blind man is really an interesting fellow. And when you read his comments and the way he comes back at people who are criticizing him, you just gotta love this guy. And you can tell that he's got real insight. He understands. You know, his, his eyes have been cleared up, but he has a greater understanding than he ever had before. He's heard things and experienced and seen things now and he sees them properly. He understands something about this man who gave him healing. And maybe he had heard about Jesus doing things like this before, but it never affected him. He wasn't in the right place at the right time. But you know, when you look at the scriptures, I think you can count six times that Jesus healed blind people. And that's quite a few out of all of the miracles Jesus did. It really is a majority. But 
in most cases, when we read of these stories of blind people being healed, it happens when they call out to Jesus. Remember Bartimaeus? He's sitting in the road, and Jesus is coming by, and he says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He shouts it out. And he says it again, Jesus, son of David, have mercy. People come up to him and say, close your mouth. The master doesn't have time for you, you blind beggar. And then Bartimaeus cries out again, Jesus, have mercy. And so Jesus stops and then heals him. And that's a wonderful thing for now, the, the, the sighted Bartimaeus. But this miracle is different. The text begins, after these things, Jesus went up and this blind man is sitting there. Stop. After what things? The connections in scripture are so fascinating. When you read back and find out what Jesus had been involved in, it's basically this. He was in Jerusalem and the Pharisees were giving him a fit. Jesus would speak the word to them and they were deaf. They didn't hear it. He would present himself to them as the Son of God, the Messiah, the Anointed One, but they didn't see it. They were blind spiritually, deaf spiritually. And then they get into an, uh, an ensuing conversation which, which became very tough. And the, dis, the Pharisees were hating Jesus, wanting to get rid of him. And they criticized Jesus for everything he did. And Jesus was strong with them, and he probably shook his finger at them and said, you people don't know what you're talking about. And then they said, well, we, our father is, is Abraham. Who are you? And then Jesus started talking about Abraham, and then he makes this, this mysterious and enigmatic statement. Before Abraham was, I am pointing to himself as Yahweh of the Old Testament, all of that stuff. And they are furious, and they say, this is blasphemy. And they take up rocks to kill him right there. And then the scripture says, but Jesus slipped away. Don't you love it? He just slipped away. I can kind of see that happening, sort of. Suddenly he's gone. Where'd he go? He slipped away. You know why he slipped away? Because his time has not yet come. It does come later, and he doesn't slip away out of the garden of the uh, olives. But nonetheless, our Lord Jesus Christ, after those things, walks away, and here he is now. There's a blind guy, and his disciples are following him. And they say, Jesus, this man over here, he's been blind from birth. Is that because he's a really bad sinner? Or is it because his parents were sinners? Give me a break, Jesus would say. It has nothing to do with his parents or him. He's blind for the sake of the glory of God. Well, my goodness. This guy's got an ailment that's going to show the glory of God. And we see how it spins out. But just stop there for a minute. What kind of ailments do you have? Maybe something to the glory of God? I have no idea. It's possible. There was a lady who lived at Lutheran Haven decades ago, and she was arthritic to the point where she could not even move. They had to literally pick her up and carry her from place to place. But the one thing she could do miraculously was quilt. And with help, she quilted hundreds of quilts all over the world. And I think about that lady, she quilted in her ailment, through her ailment, her illness, her, her blindness. It wasn't blind, but it was something else. And despite that fact, she served to the glory of God. Oh my goodness, well, you've got your own stories. But this guy here, he has no idea what his blindness is going to mean to the world. And so Jesus says, nothing to do with that. He's here for the glory of God. And then Jesus immediately doesn't say anything. He doesn't even say, do you want me to help you? He just goes up to him and he, and he takes spittle, as the old King James Version says, and he mixes it with clay and make, uh, dirt and makes clay and puts it over his eyes, which, by the way, was a common way of treating eye ailments back in the day. Maybe it was the cool, I don't know. He puts it on him and then he tells this guy, okay, get up and go and wash in Hezekiah's pool. <laughs> he didn't say Hezekiah. He said, Siloam, go there. So he does. He doesn't say what? He just does. What a, what a response of faith. So something is happening to this man. Even though he's blind, he's beginning to see there's hope for me. Even though he's deaf, he's beginning to hear a new voice, a new word. And somehow, I guess the Holy Spirit takes this and, 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 and throws it around inside of his body until finally he gets up and he says, somebody take me, take me. And he goes there, washes, and he comes back seeing 
S-E-E-I-N-G, comes back seeing. What an interesting participle. He is seeing as he goes. And he comes back and he probably falls on his knees. And then, then the ruckus starts. Because someone looks at him and says, oh my goodness, look, he sees. He used to be blind. Isn't that the man? And no, that wasn't. He just looks like, no, that's the man. And the conversation ensues. And then the dear Pharisees get involved in, who did this for you? Well, some guy by the name of Jesus, which helps me understand that I really don't think, and I may be wrong, but I don't think this blind man really knew much about Jesus. Because he said, some man called Jesus did this. Well, who do you think he is? Well, I don't know. I think he must be a prophet. And then the Pharisees get angry at this, this blind man now seeing because he's trying to tell them about theology and, and, the, and, the, and the miracles of God. They can't see what he sees. They can't hear what he's saying because they're spiritually blind and deaf. Well, the parents get involved, and I think that's an interesting twist to this story because the Pharisees go to the parents. Is this your son? Yes, that's my son. Well, he was born blind. I know that's my son who was born blind. Well, how is it he's seen? And they say, ask him, he's of age. And what's behind that is that they know that if they say anything about Jesus, which is complimentary, they're going to get ousted out of their church. They're going to get ex excommunicated from the synagogue. And that's like a sentence of death to the Jewish people of that day. Well, ask him, he's of age. <laughs> Some parents, huh? But then they go to the man, well, who healed you? Well, I told you already. Don't you believe me? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so they throw him out of the synagogue. I don't think he cares a bit. Because now he, doesn't, he knows that that's not the important thing. He can see things better now. He can hear things better now. He's been in the presence of Jesus, the word of God, and he's listened, and that has changed his heart. His ears have opened in new ways. His eyes see new things that he has never been able to see physically. But now... He sees them through physical eyes, but in a spiritual way. In this one is my salvation, my hope, my hearing, my speaking, my seeing. And so the Lord Jesus, hearing that this guy's been knocked out of the synagogue, goes to him and says, well, what do you think, fella? Who do you think that I am? I don't know who you are. Who are you? Well, I'm the son of man. Do you believe? Well, who should I believe in? Well, believe in me. Well, I do. He falls down and worships him. And that's the end of the story. But it's really just the beginning for this man. Can you imagine what he did after that? Boy, he saw things differently. He knew now that he lives in a world that needs the help from the same Savior that gave him help. He hears the word of God everywhere. And I'm sure this man maybe listened to the words coming out of the window of the synagogue, maybe heard the word of God read, and maybe he joined up with the disciples, the apostles, I have no idea, but I know this, that he's a new man. He was blind, but now he can see. He was deaf, but now he can hear. He can see the beautiful mercy of God who has cleansed him, made him new, give him new, new hope for his life. And so this Jesus comes to you this morning too and says to me and to you, hey, let me help you see things better. Let me help you hear things better. Some people will do that. Some will just go on their own stubborn ways and think, I can hear well enough, I can see well enough, I don't need God's help, and that's too bad. But let's not let that be the, 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 the case for us. We come this morning, for instance, hearing, take, eat. This is my body, this is my blood given and shed for you. The spiritual ear hears that as God's infallible promise. And then we see the bread and the wine. And we see it through spiritual eyes and know that somehow in this common bread and common wine, Jesus gives us himself to cure us of blindness, of deafness, which would do us harm. So to that we say thanks be to God. Bless us all. Amen.
Heavenly Father, we bring our offerings. Pray that you would bless them and use them according to your will. For the glory of your name and for the good of your people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, today we see your blessed Son, your servant, the Messiah, entering into the world of a blind man who has never seen. And how beautiful it is to see your mercy poured upon this man, not only giving him sight, but giving him insight to understand that you are his Savior and the Savior of all. Please, Lord, give us that insight as well. Draw us to you, to your word, and to the things that you place before us that we might hear and see and be blessed in our hearing and seeing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our congregation, Lord, as we continue our search for the pastor that you have called. Help us to find that person and to have him here as our pastor. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray for Deaconess Liz as she now has received the affirmation of a call. Please bless her as she deliberates. Help us to speak with her also about ministry that we might continue to do here in this place. Lead this process, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We ask these things, Heavenly Father, in the name and for the sake of Jesus, who teaches us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, heaven. hallowed, hallowed be, be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come. come. Thy, thy will, will be done, done on earth, earth as, as it is, is in heaven. heaven. Give, Give us this day, day our daily, daily bread. bread. And, and forgive us our trespasses, trespasses as, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And our dear Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. And in the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And may the peace of the Lord be with you. Amen. So.
your glory how far will forgiveness abound and you answer my child i love you and as long as you're seeking my grace you'll walk in the power of my daily sufficient strengthen you and keep you in his grace forever and ever. Amen. We add to our prayers now the petitions which have come from the congregation. Heavenly Father, we pray for healing for Lynn and Jean suffering from lung cancer. Please guide their physicians to find the right treatments to restore them to good health. And for baby boy Weinberger and NICU unit with breathing problems, strengthen him Help to correct his breathing problems so they make a home and be with his parents. And for President Trump and our nation's leaders, and for all of us, bring us together as one nation under God. 
guide them, their thoughts, words, and actions. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. We ask all of these things in the name and for the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen. And brothers and sisters, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his countenance and give you his peace. Amen.